Saint Joachim, father of the Blessed Virgin Mary. David through Solomon. He had two sons, Joseph and Jacob. The latter was Joseph's father. When Mathan died, his widow married a second husband named Levi, descendant of David through Nathan. The fruit of this marriage was Medat, the father of Heli, or Joachim. Joachim was a short, broad, spare man. Saint Joseph, even in his old age, was very handsome compared with him. However, in disposition and morals, Joachim was a superior man. Like Anne, he had something very distinguished about him. Both were true Israelites. But there was something in them that they themselves knew not, a yearning, a wonderful earnestness. I have rarely seen either of them laugh, although in the early part of their married life they were not particularly grave. Both possessed a calm, uniform disposition. Even in early youth, they were something like sedate old people. They were married in a small town that possessed only one obscure school, and only one priest presided at the ceremony. Courtship in those days was carried on very simply. The lovers were very reserved. They consulted each other on the subject and regarded their marriage merely as something inevitable. If the young girl said yes, her parents were satisfied. If no, and could she give good reasons for her refusal, they looked upon the affair as, ended. First the matter was settled before the parents, and then the promises were made before the priest in the synagogue. The priest prayed in the sanctuary before the rolls of the law, the parents in their accustomed place, while the young couple in an adjoining apartment deliberated in private over their intention and contract. When they had taken their determination, they declared it to their parents. The latter again conferred with the priest, who now went to meet the couple outside the sanctuary. The nuptial ceremony was celebrated the next day. Joe Chiman and lived with Elliot, Anne's father. There reigned throughout his household the severe usages and discipline of the Essenians. The house lay in the environs of Sepphoris. It formed one of a group of houses of which it was the largest. Here Joe Chiman and dwelt seven years. Anne's parents were in good circumstances. They had numerous herds and a house handsomely furnished with beautiful carpets, table furniture, etc. The servants, men and women, were many. I never saw them engaged in agriculture but herding cattle on the pasture grounds. Ismaria and Elod were pious, devout, charitable, and just. They frequently divided their herds and other possessions into three parts, one part for the temple, whither they drove it themselves and where it was received by the servants of the temple. A second part they gave to the poor or to their needy relatives, some of whom were generally present to receive it. And the third part they reserved for their own use. They lived very frugally and gave to all that asked help. When I saw all this, even in childhood, I thought, giving lasts long. He who gives gets back double, for I perceived that the third part again rapidly increased. It was soon so large that it could be again divided into three parts as before. They had many relatives who upon all solemn occasions assembled at their house. But I never even on those occasions saw much feasting. Food was indeed distributed among the poor, but grand entertainments I never saw. At these assemblies the guests generally reclined in circles on the ground, and conversed of God with earnest expectancy. It frequently happened that some of these relatives were bad people. They looked angry and displeased when Elod and Ismaria, full of heavenly longing, glanced upward as they spoke of God. But to these evil-minded people, the holy couple were ever kind. They never omitted to invite them to their reunions, and they gave twice as much to them as to others. I used to see that they with bitter feelings, impatiently coveted what Elod and Ismaria gave them with so much goodwill. It was no uncommon thing for the holy couple to give sheep, sometimes one, sometimes more, to the poor belonging to them. Here in her father's house, Anne gave birth to her first daughter, who was called Mary. I saw her full of joy over her newborn babe. It was a lovely child. I saw it growing stout and strong. It was gentle and pious, and the parents loved it. But yet, there was something about the child that I could not understand, something that indicated that it was not the one looked forward to by the parents as the fruit of their union. There was always a shade of trouble and anxiety about them, as if they had offended God, therefore they did penance, lived in continence, and multiplied their good works. I often saw them going apart to pray. They had lived in this way with their father, Eliud, seven years which I could guess by the age of their first child, 
when they resolved to withdraw from the paternal house. Their design was to live in privacy, to begin their married life anew and, by performing actions pleasing to God, to draw down his benediction upon their union. I saw them take this resolution in the paternal home and I also saw Eliad setting aside a portion of his riches for them. The herds were divided, oxen, asses, and sheep set apart for the new household. The animals named were much larger than those of our country. On the asses and oxen were packed all kinds of movables, furniture and clothing. The good people were as skillful in packing as were the animals ready to receive and carry away their loads. We do not pack our goods so skillfully on our wagons as these people could upon their beasts. They had beautiful vessels, all more highly ornamented than those of the present day. Beautiful, fragile, curiously shaped pitchers, upon which were all kinds of ornamentation like carving, were stuffed with moss, enveloped in wrappings, fastened to the ends of a strap, and hung over the back of the animals upon which were laid bundles of colored covers and garments. Some of the covers were embroidered in gold and were very costly. Father Eliot gave the departing couple a small, but heavy lump of something in a bag. It was like a lump of gold, of precious metal. When all was ready, the servant men and maids formed in procession and drove the herds and beasts of burden before them toward the new dwelling, about five or six leagues distant. The house stood upon a hill between the Vale of Natsarath and the Valley of Zebulon. A Tabin fine walk led to it. In front of it, on a bare, stony foundation, was a courtyard surrounded by a low stone wall, upon or behind which grew a hedge. On one side of this courtyard were sheds for the cattle. The door of the house, which was tolerably large, was in the centre of the building and hung upon hinges. Through it one entered the kind of anteroom, which extended the whole breadth of the house. Right and left of the hall were small apartments cut off by lightly woven partitions, or screens, that could be removed at pleasure. It was in this hall that the principal meals were laid on feasts as, for instance, when Mary was taken to the temple. Opposite the entrance, a light wicker door led from the hall into a passage upon either side of which were four apartments lying right and left. They were separated by movable wicker partitions, the upper part ending in gratings. These partitions were so placed as to form a rounded, or rather a kind of triangular space, in the middle of whose central side, just opposite the door, was the fireplace. Behind the two bleak sides, right and left, were other chambers. In the center of this kitchen there hung from the ceiling a many-branched lamp. Around the house were fields and orchards. When Jochim and Anne entered their new abode, they found everything in order, owing to the diligence of the domestics who had preceded them. They had unpacked all things as nicely and carefully as they had packed them, and everything was in its place. And servants were so handy, they did everything quietly and intelligently. They were not like the servants of our day, who have to be told every single thing. And now the holy couple began here a new married life. They made the sacrifice to God of all the preceding years, and began again as if they had only just now been united. Their only aim was by life pleasing to God, to attract upon themselves that blessing for which alone they sighed. I saw them both going to and fro among their herds. They divided them into three parts, and drove the best to the temple. The poor received the second part, and the worst was retained for themselves. They acted in the same manner with all that belonged to them. Anne had the assurance, the firm belief that the coming of the Messiah was very near, and that she herself would be of the number of his relatives according to the flesh. Her prayer was continuous and she constantly aimed at greater purity. It had been revealed to her that she was to bring forth a child of benediction. Her firstborn daughter, who had remained with her grandfather Elod, and recognized and loved as her own and Jochim's child. But she felt certain that she was not the child whom, by interior enlightenment, she knew that she was to bear. For nineteen years and five months after the birth of this first child, Jochim and Anne were childless. They lived in continued prayer and sacrifice, in mortification and continency. I frequently saw them dividing their herds, which rapidly multiplied again. Joe Chime often remained far away with his flocks in humble supplication to God. The anxiety of both and their longing after the promised blessing had reached their height. Many of their acquaintances upbraided them because of their sterility, which they attributed to some wickedness. They said that the child living with Elod was not really Anne's daughter, otherwise she would have it with her. When Joe Chime, absent with the herds, went again to the temple to offer sacrifice, 
and used to send servants out to the fields to him with numbers of things, doves, and other birds in baskets and cages. Jo Chime loaded two asses from the meadow with them, also with three little long-necked animals, white and nimble, and lambs and kids in wicker baskets. He carried a lantern at the end of a stick. It looked like a light in a scooped-out good. I saw him with his offerings journeying over a beautiful green field between Britannia and Jerusalem. I often saw Jesus in the same spot. Toward evening, Jochim reached the temple. The asses were stabled in the same place as subsequently at Mary's presentation, and the offerings were carried up the steps of the mount that led to the temple. When they had been received by the attendants, Jochim's servants returned while he himself went on into the hall in which were the water basins for the cleansing of the gifts. Thence he passed through a long corridor to a hall upon the left of the sanctuary where were the altar of incense, the table of showbread, and the seven-branched candlestick. The hall was filled with those that had brought offerings. Jo Chaim was received in a very contemptuous manner by a priest named Reuben, who would scarcely admit him. He was shoved into a corner behind grating, and his offerings were not, like those of others, conspicuously placed behind the gratings to the right of the courtyard but indifferently set on one side. The priests were around the altar of incense, upon which an offering was being made. Lamps were burning, and lights were lit on the seven-branched candlestick, but not all seven at once. I have often noticed that different arms of the candlestick were lighted on different occasions. I saw Jochim leaving the temple in great trouble. He went from Jerusalem through Britannia, and into the country of Macheris, where he sought consolation in the house of an Essenian. The prophet Manahem had once dwelt here, and also in the family of an Essenian at Britannia. This prophet had foretold to Herod while still a child his future kingdom and wickedness. From this place, Jochim went to his most distant herds on Mount Hermon. The way led through the wilderness of Gadi and over the Jordan. Hermon is a long, narrow, unbroken mountain whose sunny side is green and blooming when the other is still covered with snow. Jochim was so dejected so mortified that he would not allow his people to inform Anne where he was staying, while the trouble of the latter when she heard how things had gone at the temple and saw that Jochim did not return home, was indescribable. For five months Jochim thus remained in concealment on Haman. I saw him praying and weeping. When he went to look after his flocks and his lambs, he was often so overcome by sadness that he cast himself with covered face prostrate on the ground. His servants questioned him upon the cause of his grief. But he did not tell them that it was because he was childless. Again he divided his magnificent herds into three parts. The best he sent to the temple, the second to the Essenians, and the least he kept for himself. Anne, in the midst of her anxiety, had much to endure also from an insolent maid servant who bitterly taunted her with her sterility. She bore with her a long time, but at last she sent her from the house. The maid had requested permission to go to a feast. This was not in accordance with the strict discipline of the Essenians. Anne refused the permission, and then the maid reproached her, telling her that she deserved to be sterile and abandoned by her husband on account of her harsh and unreasonable temper. Then Anne sent her, with gifts and accompanied by two servants, back to her parents, that they might receive her safe and sound as she had come to her. She sent them also the message that she could no longer take charge of their daughter. After the girl's departure, Anne went in sadness to her chamber and prayed. When evening closed, she threw a long scarf over her head and enveloped herself entirely in it, took a covered light beneath her mantle, went out under a spreading tree that stood in the courtyard, lit the lamp and prayed. This tree was one of those whose branches strike root again and again, and thus form a whole tract of covered walk under their foliage. Its leaves are very large. I think it was with such that Adam and Eve clothed themselves in paradise. The whole tree had the characteristics of that of the forbidden fruit. The pear-shaped fruit hung usually in fives at the end of the branches. It was fleshy inside with blood-colored veins. In its center was a hollow space in which reposed the kernel. The Jews made use of the large leaves chiefly at the Feast of Tabernacles. They adorned the walls with them, laying them like the scales of a fish so that their edges closely fitted together. The tree was surrounded by groves and seats. When Anne had long besought God not to separate her from Jochim, her pious husband, although he had been pleased to deprive her of children, an angel appeared to her. He hovered above her in the air. He told her to set her heart at rest, 
for the Lord had heard her prayer, that she should on the following morning go with two of her maid servants to the temple of Jerusalem, that there under the golden gate, entering by the side of the valley of Jehoshaphat, she should meet Jochim, who was even now on his way thither, that Jochim's offering would be accepted, that his prayer would be heard, that he, the angel, had appeared also to him. The angel likewise directed Anne to take some doves with her as an offering, and promised that the name of the child she was soon to conceive should be made known to her. Anne thanked the Lord and returned to the house. When, after her lengthy prayer, she lay on her couch asleep I saw light descending upon her. It surrounded her, yes, even penetrated her. I saw her, upon an interior perception, tremblingly awake and sit upright. Near her, to the right, she saw a luminous figure writing on the wall in large, shining Hebrew characters. I read and understood the writing word for word. It was to this effect, that she should conceive, that the fruit of her womb should be altogether special, and that the blessing received by Abraham was to be the source of this conception. I saw Anne's anxiety as to how she should communicate all that to Jochim. But the angel reassured her by telling her of Jochim's vision. I received then a clear explanation of Mary's immaculate conception. I saw that, in the Ark of the Covenant, a sacrament of the Incarnation, of the Immaculate Conception, a mystery for the restoration of fallen humanity was contained. I saw Anne, with surprise and joy, reading the red and golden letters of this luminous writing. Her gladness increased to such a degree that, when she arose to set out for Jerusalem, she looked far younger than before. I saw on Anne's person at the instant the angel appeared to her a beam of light and in her a shining vessel. I cannot better describe it than by saying that it was like a cradle, or a tabernacle which had been closed but was now opened, and made ready to receive a holy thing. How wonderfully I saw this, is not to be expressed. For I saw it as if it were the cradle of salvation for the whole human race, and also as a kind of sacred vessel now opened, and the veil withdrawn. I saw it quite naturally as if one and the same holy thing. I saw, too, the apparition of the angel to Jochim. The angel commanded him to take his offering up to the temple, promised that his prayer should be heard, and told him that he should pass under the golden gate. At this announcement, Jochim was troubled. He felt very timid about going again to the temple. But the angel assured him that the priests had already been enlightened with regard to him. It was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Joe Chime and his shepherds had already erected their tabernacles. With a large herd of cattle as an offering, Joe Chime reached Jerusalem on the fourth day of the feast, and put up near the temple. Anne arrived in Jerusalem also on the fourth day of the feast. She stopped with the family of Zacharias near the fish market, and met Joe Chime for the first time only at the end of the feast. When Joe Chime approached the temple, two of the priests came out to meet him. They did this acting upon a divine inspiration. Joe Chime had brought with him two lambs and three kids. His offering was accepted, slaughtered, and burned at the customary place in the temple. But a part of it was taken and burned at another place to the right of the entrance porch, in the center of which stood the large teacher's desk. When the smoke arose, I saw a beam of light descend upon Joe Chime and the officiating priest. There was a pause, the beholders looked on in amazement and I saw two priests go out to Jochim and lead him through the side apartments into the sanctuary before the altar of incense. Then the priests laid incense upon the altar, not in grains but in the lump. It kindled of itself. The priests immediately retired to a distance and left Jochim alone before the altar. I saw him on his knees, his arms extended, while the incense offering slowly consumed itself. He remained shut up in the temple all night praying with great and ardent desires. I saw that he was in ecstasy. A luminous figure appeared to him in the same manner as to Zacheri, and gave him a roll written in shining letters. On it were the three names, Helia, Hana, Merjam, and near the last one the picture of a little Ark of the Covenant, or a tabernacle. Jochim laid the roll on his breast under his garment. The angel spoke, and will conceive an immaculate child from whom the Redeemer of the world will be born. The angel told him moreover not to grieve over his sterility which was not a disgrace to him, but a glory, for that what his spouse would conceive should not be from him but through him, a fruit from God, the culminating point of the blessing given to Abraham. I saw that Jochim could not comprehend these words. Then the angel led him behind the curtain that concealed the grating before the Holy of Holies. 
The space between the curtain and the grating afforded standing room. Then the angel held up before Joe Chime's face a shining ball that reflected like a mirror. Joe Chime breathed upon it and gazed into it. When I saw the angel holding the ball so close to Joe Chime's face, I thought of a custom in use at our country weddings, where one kisses a painted head and gives fourteen pennies to the sexton. And now, as if called up by the breath of Joe Chime, appeared all kinds of pictures in the globe. He saw them clearly, for his breath did not dim them. It seemed to me that the angel then said to him that Anne should conceive although remaining just as unsullied by him as this ball. The angel then took it from Jochim and raised it on high. I saw it hovering in the air and, as if through an opening, innumerable and wonderful pictures went into it. They were like a whole world, one picture growing out of another. Up on the highest point appeared the most holy trinity, and below, to one side, were paradise, Adam and Eve, the fall, the promise of a redeemer, no, the ark, scenes connected with Abraham and Moses, the ark of the covenant, and numerous symbols of Mary. I saw cities, towers, gateways, flowers, all wonderfully connected together by beams of light like bridges. They were all assaulted and combated by beasts and spirits, which, however, were everywhere beaten back by the streams of light that burst upon them. I saw also a garden enclosed by a dense thorn hedge. All kinds of horrible animals were trying to enter, but could not. I saw a tower stormed by numerous warriors who were, however, always repulsed. And in this way I saw innumerable pictures all bearing some reference to Mary. They were bound together by passages or bridges. In them I saw obstacles, hindrances, struggles, all of which were overcome, and the pictures disappeared successively on the opposite side of the globe, as if they had entered into the heavenly Jerusalem. But as I gazed at them dissolving in the interior of the globe, the globe itself mounted on high and I saw it no more. The angel now removed something from the Ark of the Covenant, though without opening the door. It was the mystery of the Ark, the sacrament of the Incarnation, the Immaculate Conception, the consummation of the blessing of Abraham. I beheld it under the appearance of Alamina's body. The angel blessed or anointed Jochim's forehead with the tip of his thumb and forefinger. Then he slipped the shining body under Jochim's garment and it entered into him, how I cannot say. He also gave him something to drink out of a glittering chalice which he held supported by two fingers. The chalice was of the same shape as that used at the Last Supper, but without a foot. Jochim was directed to take it with him and keep it at his home. I understood that the angel forbade Jochim to reveal anything about this holy mystery. And then, too, I understood why Zacharias the father of the Baptist, was struck dumb after receiving the blessing and the promise of Elizabeth's fruitfulness through the mystery of the Ark of the Covenant. Not till later was this mystery missed from the Ark by the priests. Then were they at first confounded. Afterward they became altogether Pharisaical. The angel now led Jochim out of the Holy of Holies and vanished. Jochim lay on the ground like one stupefied. I saw the priests enter the sanctuary, lead Jochim out reverently and place him upon a seat that stood on a raised platform where usually only priests sat. The seat was almost like that used by Magdalene in her grandeur. They bathed his face, held something to his nose, and gave him to drink. In short, they treated him as one in a swoon. Jochim was, by virtue of what he had received from the angel, quite radiant. He looked as if he had returned to the bloom of youth. Joe Chime was afterward conducted by the priests to the entrance of the subterranean passage that ran under the temple and under the Golden Gate. This was a passage set aside for special purposes. Under certain circumstances, penitents were conducted by it for purification, reconciliation, and absolution. The priests parted from Joe Chime at the entrance, and he went alone into the narrow, gradually widening, and almost imperceptibly descending passage. In it stood pillars twined with foliage. They looked like trees and vines, and the green and gold decorations of the walls sparkled in the rosy light that fell from above. Joe Chime had accomplished a third part of the way when Anne met him in the center of the passage directly under the golden gate, where stood a pillar like a palm tree with hanging leaves and fruit. Anne had been conducted into the subterranean passage through an entrance at the opposite end by the priest to whom she and her maid had brought the offering of doves in baskets and to whom also she had told what the angel had revealed to her. She was also accompanied by some women, among them the prophetess Anna. I saw Joe Chime and Anne embrace each other in ecstasy. 
They were surrounded by hosts of angels, some floating over them carrying aluminous tower like that which we see in the pictures of the litany of Loreto. The tower vanished between Jochim and Anne, both of whom were encompassed by brilliant light and glory. At the same moment the heavens above them opened, and I saw the joy of the Most Holy Trinity and of the angels over the conception of Mary. Both Jochim and Anne were in a supernatural state. I learned that, at the moment in which they embraced and the light shone around them, the Immaculate Conception of Mary was accomplished. I was also told that Mary was conceived just as conception would have been effected, were it not for the fall of man. After this, Jochim and Anne, praising God, turned toward the outer gate of the passage. They went under an arch into a space like a chapel where numerous lights were burning. Thence they passed to the gate where they were received by the priests who accompanied them back. The temple was all thrown open and decorated with garlands of leaves and fruit. Divine service was performed under the open sky. In one place stood eight pillars at some distance from one another, and over them were twined garlands of green. Jo Chiman and went for a while to one of the priests' houses in Jerusalem, and then immediately journeyed homeward. I saw them in Nazareth holding an entertainment at which many of the poor were fed and presented with arms. Jochim received numerous congratulations upon the acceptance of his offering. Upon their arrival home, the holy couple published the mercy of God with feeling, joy, and devotion. From that time they lived in perfect continence and in great fear of God. I received at this time an instruction upon the great influence exerted upon children by the purity, the continence, and the mortification of parents. Four and one half months less three days after Saint Anne had conceived under the Golden Gate, I saw the soul of Mary, formed by the Most Holy Trinity, in movement. I saw the divine persons interpenetrating one another. It became a great shining mountain, and still like the figure of a man. I saw something from the midst of the three divine persons rising toward the mouth and issuing from it like a beam of light. This beam hovered before the face of God and assumed a human shape, or rather it was formed to such. As it took the human form, I saw it, as if by the command of God most beautifully fashioned. I saw God showing the beauty of this soul to the angels, and from it they experienced unspeakable joy. I saw that soul united to the living body of Mary in Anne's womb. Anne lay asleep upon her couch. I saw a light hovering over her and from it a beam descending toward the middle of her side. I saw that beam enter into her in the form of a small, luminous, human figure. At the same instant Anne sat up. She was entirely surrounded by light and she had a vision. She saw her own person, open as it were and in it, as if in a tabernacle, a holy, luminous virgin from whom proceeded all salvation. I saw, too, that this was the instant that Mary first moved in her mother's womb. Anna rose and announced to Jochim what had taken place. Then she went out to pray under the tree beneath which a child had been promised to her. I learned that Mary's soul animated her body five days earlier than is customary with ordinary children, and that she was born twelve days sooner. Amen.